Today as we start 2 John, let me explain to you what we're going to be doing over the next few weeks. We're going to be looking at 2 John and then 3 John. In the month of September, we're going to look at Psalm 23 for the whole month. Because I believe there's so much that we just kind of overlook and we ride through the, the details and miss the details. Does that make sense? Sometimes we miss the forest for looking at the tree or we miss the trees for looking at the forest. Y'all got me? And so with that in mind, as we have walked through Esther, we closed that out last Sunday. Today we're going to begin an epistle that John wrote. Now John is an instrumental uh, man that the Lord Jesus used not only as a disciple but as an apostle. Now we know that John wrote the gospel of John and many of you in this room know John 3.16 but what John does in the gospel is according to his own pen he says I write these things that you may believe. But then John also, the Johannine, what is called the Johannine epistles, is 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. Now, I preached through 3 John way back when we did Mud Hut when I was a youth guy. Now, I don't know how many of you guys have ever heard a sermon on 2 John. You've probably heard one verse quoted out of 2 John, and you probably hadn't heard anything out of 3 John. But what we're going to do is we're going to walk over the next four to five weeks in 2 and 3 John. And so today what I want us to look at is to cover the first three verses of 2 John. Now John is one who dealt with the light, life, and love of God. All the way through John, the gospel, the epistles, he writes about the light, the life, and the love of God. As a matter of fact, there's 27 times that John records love one another. He records it from the very lips of Jesus as he gives the command in the upper room. John, in his gospel, is, everybody listen to me, gives 24% of his whole gospel to the last week of the Lord's life. In other words, 24% of the gospel of John, starting in John 13, deals with the upper room discourse and then through the last week of the Lord's life. And so what John does Opposite of what Matthew, Mark, and Luke do, which are the synoptic gospels, what John does is he gives us some details that the others leave out, particularly the last week of the Lord's life. So you remember when Jesus says, a new commandment I've given you, love one another. And so as John writes the epistles to the church, he comes back and he reiterates that love one another, that commandment of the Lord. As a matter of fact, here's what he says in 1 John. How can we say that we love God if we see our brother in need and don't do something about it, right? If we hate our brother, how can we say we love God? If we hate someone we can see, how can we love someone we can't see? Y'all got me? If we walk in the truth in 1 John, right, if we have fellowship one with another, it's because we are walking in that truth. And so as we kind of walk through this thought process of this second and third epistle, what is an epistle? An epistle is a specific letter written for a specific time, for a specific task, to a specific audience. Now, second and third John are both written to specific individuals, as well as Gaius in chapter or John or third John, we find a very interesting thought process of what John's dealing with. And so as we dive off into this this morning, we're going to look at the first three verses and then we're going to kind of halfway keep our Bibles open and kind of make some references for next Sunday as we become understanding or become students to understand what it means to love one another. Now everybody look up here for just a second. Most of us in this room think that love overrides truth. But according to the Word of God, the only way you can love somebody is in truth. And so as we are in this room, we have different walks of life, we have different backgrounds, we have different uh, thought processes, but there's only one truth. Now, there's, we live in a world where they say that truth is dependent upon the eye of the beholder, but it's not. Truth is truth whether we believe that it's true or not. Billy Graham used to say, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. No, the Bible said, said it. That settles it. Whether you believe it or not, it doesn't matter. It's the truth. So one of the things that you're going to see in 2 John and 3 John, the main subject is love and truth and truth and love. It's like two rails on a railroad track. 
you got to have love and truth, just like you got to have trust and obey. You got to have both. You can't you can't allow one to outweigh the other. And so, with that thought in mind, let's look at these first three verses again as John writes in this epistle, coming out of the gospel. He writes the first epistle, and now listen. The gospel was written so that you would believe. First John's written to those who do believe. And then second and third John are written to particular audiences or people so that we would understand that as we believe, then we ought to live in that truth that we believe that Jesus Christ has told us to love one another and to walk in the truth of who he is. Does that make sense? So let's look at these, two, these three verses. The elder, to the elect lady and her children whom I love, in truth. Now watch how many times you hear the word love and truth just in these first three verses. And not only I, but also all those who have known the truth. Because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Verse 3, grace. See, you can't get grace without truth. Mercy. You can't have mercy without truth. Peace. You can't, y- y'all see that? Verse 2 says, because of the truth that abides in us. Now that truth is a person, and we're going to look at that. Truth is not something. Truth is someone. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you. Watch this. From God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father. And he ends it with this, these words. In truth and love. Let's pray together. Lord, glorify yourself. Teach us your truth. In Christ's name, amen. Now, most people say they would quote John 4, where John would dealt with the Samaritan woman at the well. Y'all remember what Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, that the Father is searching for worshipers, true worshipers, worshipers that would worship in spirit and in truth. With that thought in mind, most people would say, well, you got to have spirit and truth. Truth, that same mindset is here in truth and love because the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Y'all got it? So if we're going to have love and truth and truth and spirit and spirit and truth and truth and love, it's all about the Spirit of God that's abiding in us. Y'all see that? He said it's because of the truth that abides in us and will, look at verse 2, I'm not preaching yet, but I'm fixing to. Because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us, how long? Forever. See, what unites us together in this room is not our social economic status. It's not our things on the outside. What unites us together is that we're sinful people in a desperate need of a holy God. What unites us together is the truth of the gospel. And so therefore, because we're united by the truth, therefore we love one another as he has loved us. And that love comes through us so that we are now bound by the spirit of Christ in love. Y'all got me? Here's why John's writing this. Apparently, there had been some people that had gone out of the church. And John's writing, and here's what he says later on. Don't even get them into your house. Because if you take those people that's left the church, left the truth, that strayed from the truth, that no longer love Jesus, no longer love us, then you are going to abide and abide in their wicked deeds. Now think about that for just a minute. Well, Brother Brad, are we not supposed to have lost friends? Yeah, you can have lost friends, but you better have some saved ones. And that's who you need to hang out with. Amen? Because the only thing that unites us together is truth. So let me give you four important truths and principles about these three verses. If y'all ready, say amen. Now I'm just going to be honest with you. Second, third John to me is going to be as rich as Esther. And I know some of y'all didn't want to get out of Esther. I didn't either. I had a great time in 13, 14 weeks. But I'm telling you, this epistle is loaded. Okay? 13 verses. Less than 300 words in the Greek. Is loaded with spiritual truths that you and I must apply in our lives as a body of believers and as believers individual. So let's look at these four truths. Y'all ready? Say amen. First of all, let's look at the, the author of this book. Now many people would, if you Google it, would say, well, you know, this may be John. It may be a different John. It could be another John. Well, here's what I know. 
John has referred to himself in the gospel of John as the one whom Jesus loved. He is the beloved disciple. So therefore, when we get to the epistle of John, as he deals with his apostleship, as he gets to second and third John, he's the last man standing. So there's no reason for him to tell everybody he's an apostle because he's the only one left. By the time we get to 95 AD, by the time we get to the turn of the first century, John does not have to have this apostleship because he's the elder. Why why does he call himself the elder? It's because he's the last of the last. So this elder, as the author, gives us some important truths about who he is. Y'all ready? Say amen. Let me just walk you through. First of all, he deals with his authority. Just because he's older doesn't mean that his authority is less. As a matter of fact, he refers to himself as the presbyteros, which is the word elder that, P- that Peter uses as well as in 1 Peter 5. But it's, it's the word to have authority over not just himself under the watch care of God, but a group of people that has been entrusted to him. That's the reason Peter says shepherds the flock. Why did Peter say that? Because Jesus told him that in John 21. Y'all got me? And so as we look at 2 John He starts out saying the elder. Now he's not introducing, he's not reintroducing himself. He's just claiming who he is so that the 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 recipients of this letter understand his authority. Number two, his age. What is his age? The word elder not only deals with his authority, but his age. He's the last apostle standing, so there's no need to address himself as the apostle. Now notice the word the. He didn't say a elder, he didn't say some elder. He said the elder. The article, the, is a particularly interesting word in the Greek. Now, for us, an article is the, a, and, those type things. But when you look at the word the, it is is specific in what the subject and dealing with that subject. In other words, it is in a area all by himself. He says, I am the elder. In other words, there are no, there are none. Same thing that Jesus says in John 14, 6. I am the way. I am the the truth, I am the life. He didn't say, I am the way, truth, and life. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. In other words, that article in the Greek puts an emphasis on the subject in which it follows. Does that make sense? So he goes, the elder. Why? Because of his authority. Not only because of his authority, not only because of his age, it also dictates and determines and displays his attitude. See, most of us would think that John is some little meek guy because he leaned on the breast of Jesus and he always was kind of in the background. Peter always opened his mouth and did what, you know, John's always kind of in the background even though. But let's look at Mark 9, 38. What's his attitude? Now John answered him saying, Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name and we forbade him because he does not follow us. If you go and read that, when we walk through Mark 9, if you guys remember, here's what they asked Jesus. Do you want us to call fire down on them? Listen, John is specific in truth, unwavering, uncompromising. And so as he writes this epistle, as he calls himself the elder, his, his personality really comes out. So don't walk in this through this book going, well, you know, he's just kind of gentle and meek and, you know, he kind of hung out with Jesus and everything. No, no, no. John, John wants to make sure that truth is stood up for, but we have to do it in love because truth is what causes us to love. See, if you really love somebody, you will tell them the truth. So, not only... His attitude, but what about his ambition? Mark chapter 9, same thing. Mark records something that John doesn't even record about himself. What is his ambition? Look at Mark 9, 34, and then we'll jump to to chapter 10. It says, but they kept silent, for on the road they had been disputing among themselves who would be the greatest. Now, who is this? This is James and John. What's going on? They're arguing over who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. As a matter of fact, they done got their mama invested in it. Their mama has come and said, hey, Lord, when you get into your kingdom, make sure one of my sons sits on your right and one sits on the left. Y'all with me? 
So here's the guy that's writing about truth and love. Here's the guy that's writing about loving one another. Here's the guy that in John 13 saw Jesus kneel down and wash Judas' feet. Before the Lord's Supper began to be instituted into the new covenant, the new command, love one another. So what is his ambition? Man, his ambition wanted to be greatest. His ambition wanted, listen to me, to be right all the time. You can walk in truth and not always be right. Did you hear what I just said? Man, you don't have to post it on Facebook. When you walk in truth, people will know it. Look at chapter 10, verse 35 and 37. Look at what happens. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Now let me say this, just by way of being a Bible student, it's usually James and John, James and John, James and John. You know why? Because under all indication, John was younger than James. You always mention the elder first. So when John gets a chance, he's going to write the elder. Can I get an amen? He's tired of living in the shadows. So then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now watch this. And he said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us that we may sit, one on your right hand, the other on your left, in your glory. Now they didn't want to rob the glory. They just wanted to be rubbing elbows with the ones that was the powers that be. Does that make sense? Well, by the time John writes the second epistle of John, he's the only one standing. I mean, it's easy to stand when you got 10 or 12 folks with you, but what happens when you're the only one left? What what happens when the message that you're preaching, you're the only one preaching it? Because everybody else has run after the deception. Does that make sense? So here's John. He's got an ambition, man. He He wants to be right. He wants to climb the ladder. But this is what I love about John is he's got some absolutes. What, are, what is his absolutes as an elder? Well, it's truth and love. Those are the absolutes that John has. We got to walk in truth and we got to walk in love. But, Brother Brad, how do we walk in love? Well, you got to know the truth. Because if we walk in love with no truth, then what we call love is really not love, and therefore it's really not truth. Does that make sense? So with that thought in mind, let me just kind of pop that up there. I just want to walk you through just a couple things. John had an unwavering regard for truth. He was uncompromising. And sometimes, listen, John was very narrow. As a matter of fact, John probably couldn't pastor most Baptist churches because he'd take the role and it would be down to very minimal people. You understand? Because what he required in his writings and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God would have run most people off. Watch this. There is light and darkness in his gospel. There's life and death. There's the kingdom of God. There's the kingdom of the devil. In other words, John's going, look, there's no gray area with me. You're either the son of the devil or you're the son of God. John says you're either in the kingdom of darkness or you're in the kingdom of light. You're either believing or you're unbelieving. Does that make sense? Watch this. There are the children of God. There are the children of the devil. There are those who confess their sins. There's a, there are those who deny their sins. Just read through the Johannian writings. There's the judgment of the righteous and there's the judgment of the wicked. There is salvation. There's damnation. There's receiving Christ and there's rejecting Christ. All the way through these Johannian writings, from the Gospels all the way through the three epistles, John deals with this absolute of truth and love. Here's what he said Jesus said, and I believe Jesus said it, not because John wrote it, because I believe Jesus said it. Here's what he said. If you love me, you will obey me. See, love drives obedience to truth. Y'all understand that? So therefore, our obedience is a direct reflection of how much truth we know and how much we love. It's not about a performance. It's about a heavenly provision that you and I get on because it's the truth that abides in us. Not only in me, but in you and us collectively. And we'll be forever. Have you ever stopped to think about what heaven's going to be like? 
Heaven is not going to have your opinion in it. It's not going to have my opinion in it. It's going to be full of truth and it's going to be full of love because of the truth that brings love. And therefore, we love the truth and the truth brings love. And so, therefore, it's a never-ending cycle throughout all of eternity of love and truth by the Spirit of God that we'll worship in spirit and truth and be true worshipers. Can I get an amen to that? It's here in this epistle that John can be described as having an intolerant devotion to what's true. Now, here's the truth of it, guys. If John was pastoring the church today and you missed two Sundays, you just gone. You understand? He, he ain't got time for you. It's in, he's clear cut in his spiritual realities. There's nothing vague in this, in his world according to the things of God. Now, we have to stay balanced, amen? Say amen. We have to, st- we, we got to stay balanced in love and in truth. But with John, he's like, let's just call fire down on them. Tell them they can't do that. It's in this epistle, John calls for the separation from those who are not faithful to the truth. As a matter of fact, look down in verse um, 6. It says, this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. There's the truth. This is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Watch verse 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and, 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 and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things which we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. I mean, there's no gray area. He says, you say one thing, but you don't do what you're supposed to do, then guess what? John says, you don't have God. You go, now, wait a minute, John, you got to have a little grace there. Where's your love on this thing? Well, we'll walk through that next week, okay? But I think John is clear cut. Can we say he's clear cut on that? I mean, he doesn't, he, he don't mince his words. He says what he means and means what he says. Amen? Would to God we'd have that today instead of all this deflecting. When they ask a politician a question, they turn around and say something that you have no idea what they just said. I mean, it's so bad you forgot that question. Much less don't even know what the answer is. So, the first thing is the author. Now, let's go to the audience. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because commentators are split just about 50-50 on this. Okay? Folks like John MacArthur, folks uh, like R.C. Sproul, uh, those, those guys would say this is a woman. It is a particular woman. It is a woman that is literal. Um, Matthew Henry says that. But then you got people like John Phillips and others that says this is a figurative statement about the church. You say, Brother Brad, what do you think it is? Well, it don't matter what I think. What does the Bible say? Okay? So I believe the Bible best explains the Bible. Okay? There's individuals that would say that that this, if this is a woman who has it in her house, that she was hospitable, and I don't doubt that at all, that she possibly had traveling evangelists that was preaching the false doctrine that she was housing and didn't know it. But the problem with it is what verse 13 says. Verse 13 says, the children of your elect sister greet you, amen. Now, the church is referred to in a figurative sense as the bride of Christ. As a matter of fact, Paul, uh, John ends his life, the last days of his life, in the church at Ephesus. But he's overseeing the seven churches of Asia Minor. How do I know that? Because of the book of Revelation chapter 2 and 3. So the seven churches of Asia Minor, he got a revelation from God. Can I get an amen? And so who are the who is it? Well, let me just throw these two things up there both times and we'll just move right on. Because the truth of it is, is no matter if it's a real lady or if he's talking figuratively to the church, the message is still the same. Walk in truth. Walk in love. Does that make sense? Don't get twisted up about it. So I think it can be either or both and. You go, well, Brother Brad, it's an epistle. What do you think it is? I think it's really the church. Why do I think it's the church? Here's the reason why. 
because the elect sister is another sister. It's not the nieces and nephews. They are being greeted by the other brothers and sisters in Christ because he says not only us, but to all those who believe the truth. Y'all got me? Now, so let's just look at the two things. Figuratively, if it's a church, it's a group that's joined by confession. In other words, we confess that we need Jesus. We confess all the things that we confess according to the Word of God, right? So therefore, we're the body of Christ. We're the bride of the Lord Jesus. But if it's a literal individual woman, they're just a group joined by blood. You just go, well, Brother Brad, why are you making a big deal over this? Because if you're going to study the Bible and you're going to go to commentators, you better be very careful because they're going to tell you what they believe. And that's fine. You go to... Uh, Different sides. Here's one. Y'all ready? I got two commentators that just say it could be both, which means I don't know what it really is. Playing safe, right? I believe it's the church. I believe it's a figurative statement about the church because John is dealing with those who have gone out and those who are preaching a gospel. And now, if they name the name of Christ, church discipline ought to be de being dealt with when they come into the city, then somebody ought to go, to, wait a minute, dude, you're, you're speaking the wrong gospel. Amen? So let's go to number three. Moving right along. Not only do you find the author being the elder, the audience being the elect lady and her children, look at what it says. What's the admonition whom I love? You say, Brother Brad, why do you think it's a church? Well, listen to this. He says, to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also those who have known the truth, because of the truth which abides in us and will be forever. Grace and mercy and peace, right? Look at verse 4. I rejoice greatly that I found some of your children walking in truth. See, if it was a literal lady, He would not have addressed her and saying that all of her kids are walking in truth or some of her kids are walking in truth. But in verse number one, he says, whom and your children. Y'all see the inclusiveness? Work with me. Do y'all see the inclusiveness there? To the elect lady and her children. And then he comes and he says, some of them are walking. Not all of them, but some of them. Well, there was inclusiveness as he writes this letter, as he's encouraging so what's the admiration? What is, he, what is he saying? He says, whom I love. Here's what John says. How do I love them? I love them, in, I love them in truth. I love them because they love the truth. So here's the question, church. Here's the question, individual sitting in this room. Do you love the truth? Do you really love the word of the Lord? So what's the admonition? Two things. Y'all ready? Say amen. First of all, John's love for the church. What is his love for the church? Well, he wrote a gospel. He wrote the book of Revelation. There are warnings and woes throughout all those two chapters, right? Repent or else. Repent, repent. Coming from the lips of Jesus, this revelation that he gets. And so with that thought in mind, what is John's concern? John's concern is truth and love, but where is, he, where is his concern at? In the body. He's going, listen, don't receive anybody. Don't allow anybody to believe or even walk in, in even the atmosphere of something that's not true. So with that thought in mind, this love that he has for the church, he 27 times in three epistles, he says, love one another. Where does he get that from? That night as he sat at the table. And Jesus took bread and he said, this is a new covenant. This is a new commandment. Could you imagine John leaning his head on the breast of Jesus, hearing the heartbeat of heaven? Did you hear what I just said? And when Jesus goes, now when are you going to betray me? And Peter goes, hey, ask him who it is. And all the disciples get to going, well, is it I? Is it I? Is it I? Is it I? See, I believe John who was part of the Mount of Transfiguration, saw everything that went on. John, who went inside the, in, inside the, the room when Jairus' daughter was raised. John, who saw Tabitha raised. John, who ran past Peter and went into the tomb. When he looks and says, hey, y'all need to love each other as a body. Because those folks out there, 
They don't really like us. We've left our Jewish tradition. The synagogue hates us. And the very Sanhedrin that we've looked up to our whole life crucified our Lord. So you better learn to love one another. But you better love in truth. And truth must be the driving force and source for our love. Not our preference of music, not our preference of whether or not they have a gymnasium, not our preference of whether we like the carpet or whether we like all the things that go on in Sunday school. Our preference must be truth. Amen? Amen? <laughs> Number two, not only do you find the love for the church, Paul has, I mean, John has a, a love for the truth. Love does not define truth, but truth defines truth. Love. Look it over, over to John, uh, 3 John. Just turn to John, 3 John, verse number 4. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. If the Lord gives us time, we'll get through that over the next few weeks. So in, in 3 John, he calls them his children. In 2 John, he called her her children. And he says, there's no greater joy in my life than to watch people walk in truth. Let me tell you what's awesome about preaching. Better yet, let me tell you what's awesome about expository preaching. Is when you're preaching and people are reading ahead and the light comes on before you say it. It is awesome that when you see people tracking and when you say it, it goes, ah, they tie it together because they've already went ahead and seen it. And then all I got to do is explain what you saw. I don't have to tell you what to see. I just explain what you saw. Amen? Here's what John says. Man, there's no greater joy than to watch my children walk in truth. Why? Because now they're practicing that which he's written, that they're loving one another, holding each other accountable to the truth, that truth being the, the common factor in which they get together, they serve, they sing, they pray, they do all that they do because of Jesus Christ who has deposited his life on the inside of them. It's no longer them who's living, but it's Christ who's living on the inside of them. And now the world is going to be different because John heard from the lips of Jesus, this world will know that you're my disciples for the love that you have for one another. And then he said this, this world will know that the Father has sent me by the way you love. How do I love? It's because I love the truth. You go, Brother Brad, how much did he love the truth? He was willing to be bold for the truth. He was willing to die for the truth. He was willing to be isolated on the island of Patmos for the truth. And he lives the last days of his life in the city or the area of Ephesus in Asia Minor to help Timothy, who was left in Ephesus, to get the elders in order. Who better else to help the elders get in order than he go, uh -uh, ladies and gentlemen?